Matthew 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've read that, we've heard that, but I wonder if we've ever decided or thought about what does a pure heart look like? If we're going to have a pure heart, what does that look like? Let me start this by reading this old poem with which we're all familiar. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you'd serve him would be the very best. And you'd keep assuring him you're glad to have him there, that serving him in your home is a joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched in welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in? Or hide some magazines and put the Bibles where they'd been? Would you turn off the radio and ha hope he hadn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered that last loud hasty word? Would you hide your world of music and put some hymn books out? Would you let Jesus walk right in or would you rush about? I wonder if Jesus spent a day or two with you, would you go on doing the things you always do? Would you go on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family's conversation keep up its usual pace, or would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read and let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you plan to go, or would you maybe have to change your plans for a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends, or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on, or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? Might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus came in person to spend some time with you. So obviously the question for us this morning is how serious are you and your family about having a pure heart? If Jesus really did come to your house, what changes would you need to make? I'm going to talk to the men, then I'm going to talk to the women, then I'm going to talk to both, and then finish the lesson. So with the men, I wonder how pure our hearts really are when we listen to some of the jokes we listen to and tell some of the jokes we tell. Wonder how pure our hearts are when we turn on the TV and watch some of that stuff or watch things on the Internet. Wonder how pure our hearts are when we check out all the women. I wonder if we get more enjoyment from the NFL cheerleaders than we do the ball games. I wonder if we watch the Victoria's Secrets commercials and maybe even the specials they have. Wonder how we treat our coworkers. Wonder what comments we make to them. I wonder if they're ever filled with sexual innuendos. Wonder what comments we make about them when they're not listening. I wonder what we're thinking when we're walking down the mall checking out everybody. I have a DVD series called We Fight Porn or Dangers of Internet, uh, Porn in the Internet. And in that, I interviewed a young man who was all into porn. And here's what he said. He said, I love going to the mall. You have to listen to this. And looking at the young girls. He said, it's like being let loose in a candy store. He said, if people knew what I was thinking, they would not allow me anywhere near that mall. So I wonder what we're doing as men to keep our hearts pure. I wonder what responsibility we have for controlling 
our lustful nature. Maybe we need to ask ourselves, how pure is my heart? And a lot of times we don't talk to the women, but I want to just a little bit. I wonder about the clothing you choose to wear. Are you into the latest styles, many of which are totally form-fitting? As one lady told me, it leaves nothing to the imagination anymore. I wonder if women have any responsibility for the looks you get due to the clothing you wear. As they say, I was born at night, but not last night. So you really can't convince me that you're so naive that you don't know when you're wearing something that's provocative or on the edge. I have a session in one of my seminars, and if Renee doesn't go, uh, if Renee goes, if it's close enough, she handles this. If I, well, like I was in uh, Pittman, New Jersey not long ago, and she wasn't able to go, of course, so I, I did the for women only session. And one of the things I try to bring out is I talk frankly about some of the women's issues, one of which is the three kinds of men there are. And I'm not trying to be inappropriate at all, but in dealing with men and their fantasies and talking to them about pornography and how it affects them, I've come to the conclusion there's three kinds of men. There's leg man, breast man, and fanny man. And boy, you ought to hear some of the fantasies these men have. I wonder if women bring inappropriate attention to those body parts, I wonder if there's some kind of culpability on their part. But let me hasten to say, if you're wearing modest clothing, if you're wearing clothing that's not revealing and enticing and men look and lust, it's not your fault. You and I know men who lust at anything in a skirt. It's not your fault. And a lot of times, well, actually not a lot of times, on occasion, after that session is over, I have a lady come up to me and she say, well, preacher, I hope you don't mind me telling you what I think. I said, I never mind that. She said, you're the pervert. If you think that's the way men are, then you really don't understand. You're the problem. Well, let me make sure you understand it's always wrong for a woman to lust after a woman who's not his wife. Every time, every situation, no exception. It's always wrong. It's always his decision. It's always his responsibility. And the old joke from Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it, is absolute nonsense. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. But the truth is, to the extent a woman encourages and brings on this behavior in men, she too is culpable. wonder how our hearts are. I was speaking at a church, it really wasn't too long ago, and afterward a man came to me and said, Preacher, I understand what you were saying. He said, I can't hand the Lord's Supper out anymore. And I went, what's the deal with that? He said, there's some women in this church that wear such low-cut dresses. When I hand the Lord's Supper out, I look down and I'm thinking about everything except the Lord. So I just decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. Another time I was preaching at a church, filling in for a little while, at a church uh, north of Greer's Ferry. And the senior high school there were called the Blue Devils. I have a little problem calling yourself a devil in the first place, but that's for another sermon. The Blue Devils. And so the cheerleaders came out in their little skimpy costumes, and on one side of their rear end it said blue, and on the other side it said devils. So every time they flipped, every time they did a routine, every time they cheered, every time they turned around, what you would see is blue devils, blue devils, blue devils. And it was fixed so your eye would automatically go there. I wonder if what they were really saying is, uh, look at my bottom. wonder how pure our hearts 
really are. I wonder sometimes what we're teaching our children. And let's talk about to men and women. That pretty well takes up everybody. Uh, what about the movies you watch? What about the TV shows? What about the DVDs? What about magazines? What about the racy novels? And I'm always amazed when people go to the beach. You go to the beach sometimes and you wear stuff that if someone walked in your bedroom and you were wearing that, they'd call the cops and arrest you. But for some reason, we can go to the beach and wear as little as possible, whether it's a man or a woman, and for some reason we think that's okay. What about internet sites? What about the language you use or allow in your home? A lot of us would never think of using profanity, especially some of the really nasty words. But we allow that on our TV. If someone came in and said, M this and M that, and you know what I'm talking about, if they started talking like that, we would excuse them, wouldn't we? We'd say, I'm so sorry. You can stay, but you can't use that kind of language. I've actually done that. But then we sit down and turn on a movie, and it's got that language, and our attitude is, well, it's not the worst I've ever seen. Tell you, one of the things I have noticed is I've had people through the years I've been doing this say, well, you know, I see a lot of movies that aren't all that great. I see stuff on the Internet that's not that great. I read books that aren't that great. But, you know, I don't like some of it, but I can handle it. I've had people say, well, I can take it or leave it. Every time they're taking it. Every single time they're taking it. You talk to people in addiction, they say, well, I don't have to have this. I can take it or leave it. Every one of them are taking it until they get into a decent program like we have here. So maybe we need to ask ourselves, how pure is our heart? Helen Keller was asked, isn't it terrible to be blind? And she said, well, it's better to be blind and see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. Kind of interesting, isn't it? We've all heard about the six blind men from India who were taken to a palace, and out in front of the palace was an elephant. So each one touched the elephant, and then they explained what they saw. First one walked up and touched the side of an elephant, and he said, well, an elephant's like a wall. The next one touched his trunk and said, an elephant is like a snake. Next one touched the tusk and said, an elephant's like a spear. The next touched the leg and said, well, an elephant's like a tree. The next touched the ear and said, an elephant's like a fan. The sixth blind man touched the tail and said, an elephant's like the rope. Were they right? Well, they didn't have all the truth, did they? They all thought they had the truth. They all thought they could tell someone exactly what an elephant was like, but they only had a limited perspective. Let me bring that analogy into the spiritual realm. I think a lot of times people have an inaccurate conception of what God is. You know, in Psalm 50, 21, God says, You thought I was just like you. Don't we do that a lot of times? We think God's just like us. But we have to be careful not to think of God in our own terms. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at the appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for God sees not as man sees. For a man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the what? Heart. It's clear that God looks beyond our behavior, 
and beyond our appearance to the real issue. And God says the real issue is the heart. Not just in the New Testament, also in the Old Bible. When David prayed for his son Solomon in 1 Chronicles 29, 19, he says, And give to my son Solomon a perfect heart to keep thy commandments, thy testimonies, and thy statutes, and to do them all. So the one thing David prayed for his son was to have a perfect heart. Then in 2 Chronicles 12, speaking of King Rehoboam, the Bible says he did evil because his heart was not right in the sight of God. The heart apparently determines our standing before God. So when Jesus talks about a pure heart, What does pure heart really mean? Does it mean perfection? Does it mean sinlessness? If it does, we're all in trouble because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. In the Greek, the word that's translated pure is a word that sounds very familiar to you. In the Greek, it's katharos. It's the word we've transliterated to catharsis. And catharsis in English means to make pure by cleansing. So when you look at the Bible heart, and the scripture refers to the heart, what it's really talking about is the brain. This is your brain. This is your real heart. When the Bible says have a pure heart, it's not talking about this. We know that. And the Bible heart, when you look at the Bible you realize it deals with the mind, the will, and the emotions. So everywhere I know of in Scripture, the Bible talks about the heart. You can substitute the word brain. Proverbs 4.23, Watch over your heart, brain, with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. Matthew 15.19, Jesus says, For out of the heart, the brain, comes evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and slanders. So the heart, the brain, is composed of the mind and the will, and the heart, the brain, determines our behavior. So when the Bible says you have to have a pure heart, it says you have to have a pure brain. So our hearts should be characterized by undivided devotion to God. And the call of Jesus is clear. We are to be devoted to him. So how is our brains today? How pure is our brain? How undivided is our brain? Do we have half of it in the world and half of it in the church? Do we have most of it in the world, but Sunday morning we show up and everything's cool for a little while? Psalm 51.10, David prays, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. We sing that song, don't we? Create in me a clean brain, O God. The reason we need a pure brain is apparently only those with pure, forgiven brains are going to see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So it's apparent that God reserves intimate, eternal fellowship with Him to those whose hearts are loyal and devoted to Him. You know, he gets pretty rough, he, Jesus, gets pretty rough with people who claim they're religious. And in the New Testament, a lot of times he talks to the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verses 20, uh, uh, verse, well, I, said, I wrote that wrong. I got verse 25 through 18. That wouldn't be right. That'd be 25 through 28. Here's what he says. Woe to you, Pharisees, you religious leaders, hypocrites, You're so careful to polish the outside of the cup, but the inside is foul with extortion and greed. 
blind Pharisees. First cleanse the inside of the cup, and then the whole cup will be clean. Woe to you, Pharisees, and you religious leaders, hypocrites. You're like beautiful mausoleums, full of dead men's bone and of foulness and corruption. You try to look like saintly men, but underneath those pious robes of yours are hearts, brains, besmirched with every sort of hypocrisy and sin. Whew. Not too good, is it? Everyone's heard of Max Licato. A lot of y'all have probably read his book, The Applause of Heaven. In The Applause of Heaven, he talks about the change of heart we all need, and he tells it by this story. At the time, he and his wife and family were living in... Re, re, <laughs> say it for me. Rio de Janeiro. That's it, what she said. They were living down there. They were working as missionaries, and one day they had planned on going on this week-long trip. And, of course, they were running late, so they all run out and get in their all-terrain vehicle to take off, and Max remembers he hasn't turned off his ham radio. And apparently they always did that when they left, so he runs back in, and he grabs the plug and runs out to the car, not knowing that he unplugged his freezer instead of the ham radio. And what makes it worse, he says he just filled the thing up with fresh meat. So the thing was full of meat. And it's in Reed de Gia, yeah, what she said, uh, in the middle of the summer, and it was hotter than blazes. They were gone seven days. They get home, and his wife says, well, I think I'll fix some dinner. She goes to the freezer, opens it up, and nearly falls over from the stench. And as most women would do, and I applaud this, she said, Max, you made the mess, you clean it up. So it was his job to clean it up. He said it was, quote, a moving experience. And then he writes this tongue-in-cheek. This is quoted from his book. What's the best way to clean out a rotten interior? I knew exactly what to do. I got a rag and a bucket of soapy water and began cleaning the outside. I was sure the odor would disappear as I buffed and wiped and polished. But when I opened the door, the smell was revolting. No problem, I thought. I knew what to do. This freezer needs some friends. I'd stink too if I had the social life of a machine in the utility room. So I threw a party. I invited all the appliances from the neighborhood. Everyone played pin in the socket and had a few laughs about limited warranties. I was sure the social interac interaction would cure the inside of the freezer, but when I opened it up, the stink was even worse. So I had an idea. If the polish job and a social life wouldn't help, I'd give the freezer some status. So I bought a Mercedes sticker and stuck it on the door. I installed a cell phone on the side and I opened the door, still repulsive. So I could only think of one other option, pleasure. I think this is cute. So I bought copies of Playfridge, the publication that displays freezers with their doors open. I rented some Foxy films. My favorite was The Big Chill. After a few days of supercharged after-hours entertainment, I opened the door and I nearly got sick. Then he concludes like this. I know what you're thinking. The only thing worse than Max's humor is common sense. He says, who would concentrate on the outside when the problem is on the inside? He said, you really want to know? He said, a housewife battles with depression. What's the solution offered by close friends? Buy a new dress. Get another job. Or a husband is involved in an affair that brings him as much guilt as it does adventure. The solution, change peer groups. He says, hang out with people who don't make you feel guilty. Or a person's plagued with insecurity and restlessness. The answer, buy a new car, go on a hunting trip, go on a vacation, change your style, change your look, flash some cash. That'll give you the lift you need. 
And then he says, case after case of treating the outside while ignoring the inside. And the result, the depression, the guilt, the insecurity leaves for maybe a day, maybe a week, but it always returns and it's always worse. The outside is altered, the inside is faltered. The real and lasting answer, true happiness comes from the inside out. Titus says, to the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. He says, a liar will never believe anybody because to him all are liars. The thief will never trust anybody because he sus uh, suspects everyone. He says, why does God call for our hearts to be clean? He says, because God says that it's from the heart the brain, that all human problems come. Jeremiah 17. The heart is the most deceitful thing there is and des desperately wicked. No one can determine how bad it is. Matthew 15, 19. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, lying, and slander. So Max says, here's the big question. How can we have a pure heart? He said what Jesus is talking about here is beyond any person's accomplishment, isn't it? He says further down the passage, in chapter 5, verse 48, Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's quite the catch-22, because we can't be perfect. He says we all... No, we can't be perfect this sign of heaven. None of us perfectly shows a poverty of spirit or perfectly mourns over our sins or is perfectly humble and gentle. None of us perfectly hunger and thirst after righteousness. None of us are perfectly pure in heart. He said it's like a coal miner coming from underground telling him that his hands and face ought to be clean. How is that possible? It's not possible. So what are we to do? Max said, there's only one thing we can do, throw ourselves on the grace of God and receive his renewal in our lives. I know I'm quoting a lot from Max, but this is good stuff. This sort of purity, however, isn't something we consume. Rather, it's an inside-out issue. What we're thinking about is a condition of the heart. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It means our motives are unmixed. A person who has a clean heart is a person of integrity. It's where we do what we say. Now there's a concept, isn't it? Do what we say. God's concerned with what we do, but even more concerned with why we do them. So God's concerned about our motives. Matthew 6, take heed that you do not uh, your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Is it possible, he says, to do good things with wrong motives? With wrong motives? Sure. Search me, O God, and know my heart, my brain. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wickedness in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. For God understands all hearts and he sees you. He who guides your soul knows you. He will repay all people as their actions deserve. Proverbs 24. So let's try to wrap this up. And I want to do that by asking a question. How do we know how well we're doing? How can we determine how our hearts are? Here's a three-part test. I think it's pretty valid. First part of the test is look at our activities. Where do we invest our time, our talents, and our money? We say, who's first in your life? And we all go, well, the Lord's first in our life. So let's put that to the test. Pull out your bank statement. Pull out your day planner. Let's look at our giving. And let's look at how we're spending our time. Does God get the first and the best? Or does he get what's left over at the end of the day, whether it's our money or our time? 
Second part of the test is look at our anxieties. What are we worried about? You know, you can tell a whole lot about people by what they're concerned about, what they're worried about. Matthew 6, Therefore I say to you, don't worry about your life, what you eat or what you drink, nor about your body. What you'll put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Pretty hard to live up to that, isn't it? But you know, in Matthew 6, it's very interesting how Jesus lists the top five worries of humanity. Verse 24, finances. 25, food. 27, fitness. 28, fashion. 34, future. Finances, food, finance, uh, finances, food, fitness, fashion, and future. And if we're unduly worried about any of these things, you think it might mean God isn't really number one in our lives? So the first test is look at our activities. The second is look at our anxieties. And then the last one is look at our ambitions. Our goals, our ambitions, reveal our heart, don't they? Whatever our number one goal is, could it be that that thing is our God? Are we more worried about our ambition? Are we putting our ambitions in front of Jehovah God? Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus doesn't say, Be looking for your ambitions and see if they hook up with the ambitions of the world. What he says is be ambitious for him, for his kingdom, for his righteousness, and everything else will be provided. So today's question again is, how is our heart? Psalm 24, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, who will stand in his holy place? Listen, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, a pure brain. Billy Graham said, we're suffering from only one disease in the world, it's not a race problem, it's not a poverty problem, it's not a war problem, it's a heart problem. And he goes on to say the problem of sin isn't the world around us, it's the world in us. Isn't that right? Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind your brain, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. One more story, and I'm going to hush. The machine that usually did this job was broken. So they had to hire a guy to paint the lines on a newly surfaced remote highway. So they hired the guy, and he got the wide paintbrush, and the first day... He painted nine miles. And the supervisor was so impressed, he said, man, I'm going to hire you full time. You do better than the machine, and you go for it. Well, the second day, he only painted four miles. And the third day, he painted one mile. And the fourth day, he painted a quarter mile. And the supervisor came to him and said, I'm going to have to fire you. You're just not doing what you're supposed to do. And the guy said, it's not my fault. I was getting further and further away from the paint can. Well, as we attempt to be pure in heart, we have to remember that he is our source. And we need to stay close to the source. And we do that through worship. We do that through prayer. We do that through Bible study. We do that through devotional. We do that by being in community with believers on a regular basis and developing authentic, intimate, personal relationships with each other. That's the great thing I see about you ladies. Oh, you, you're close come to graduations and everybody's crying and carrying on. The first time I thought, that's a little overblown. And then I heard him and I thought, man, 
What am I crying for? I saw how close y'all got. That is wonderful. That's wonderful. So let me end with this. Pure in heart, O God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly to thee. Watch thou my wayward feet. Guide me with counsel sweet. Pure in heart, help me to be. Pure in heart, O God, help me to be. Teach me to do thy will most lovingly. Be thou my friend and guide. Let me with thee abide. Pure in heart, brain, help me be. Pure in heart, O God, help me to be. Until thy holy face one day I see. Keep me from secret sin. Reign thou my soul within. Pure in heart, help me to be. God, help us to work on being pure in heart. If you're in the audience this morning, it's our custom at Remmel to have you go to the back. If you have anything you want to talk about, pray about, get help with, while we sing this song, if you'll go to the back, someone will be back there and meet you. We'll stand and sing.